Uh, today we will hear uh, from John Murphy, who is a student at George Mason University. Uh, John is in his final year, and you are also at Syracuse, right? Uh, you have an appointment, right? For, uh, so can you tell us a little about that? I, I didn't see any details on your website. So. Yeah, which actually, you're right, I probably should have updated the website before I started putting out job applications. Um, but yeah, I'm here as a Mercatus dissertation fellow working with Roger Koppel at the uh, uh, at his institute, the Institute for an Entrepreneurial Society, where we're taking actually some of the ideas that I'm going to talk about today and uh, applying them to the uh, entrepreneurial management literature on experts uh, out there. So. Excellent, excellent. Okay, and you are now in your uh, starting the job application process. Uh, and if I recall correctly, the research uh, focus is law and economics, Smithian political economy, and uh, expert failure. Well, uh, yeah. market failure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Which I mean, basically, expert. I just see expert failure as old school Smithian style thinking and law and economics. Roger would object. Roger would say it's more Mandeville. I say Adam Smith is the beginning of the universe. So, <laughs> all right. Well, great. Okay. So yeah, the screen is yours, and uh, please go ahead with your with your presentation, John. Sure. Oh, Can you? Just actually, I need to do share before I uh, actually. Uh, multi okay. Now you can actually share. <laughs> Show your screen. Yeah, cool, cool. All right. So let me see. Are you guys seeing the PowerPoint or like my presenter view? Oh, PowerPoint, no presenter view. Yeah. Okay, good, 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 good. So uh, thanks all of you for coming on either what's the end of the semester or the beginning of winter break. Um, I appreciate uh, you taking your time to spend this afternoon with me. I'm John Murphy. I know, I think I know everybody here. Um, some of you may have seen this last spring at the Public Choice Society meetings where I presented a more rough version of this, um, this paper. Uh, things have since uh, advanced. Um, so I'm happy to be presenting this, this newer version and I'm really looking forward to getting some, uh, some good feedback. So cascading expert failure is based off some work that I'm doing with this guy, Roger Koppel here. Um, it's kind of wormed its way into my, dis uh, into my uh, dissertation. This uh, is a chapter of my dissertation. Um, and the basic idea is expert failure's main research focus has been on the immediate interaction between the buyer and the seller. If you read Roger's book, if you check out the research that uh, Roger, Abby Devereaux, Dave Goodman, and I have done in Cosmos and Taxes, uh, it's very much limited to just the immediate interaction between the buyer and the seller. There's the buyer of expert opinion and the seller of expert opinion. And there can be failures uh, there. That's what Roger's uh, book is primarily about. And in a sufficiently large or diverse economy, expert failure is probably sufficiently random that the law of large numbers suggests there's not going to be a large macroeconomic effect from expert failure. You won't have a cascade of, of uh, failures. Relatively small failures here and there really won't show up in the macroeconomic um, uh, picture. That's Rob, uh, Robert Lucas's argument against uh, market failure. Um, uh, in the 1970s, but uh, what if there's a sole supplier to multiple buyers? Well, this was a question that started to come up in 2008, the too big to fail argument that many of you might remember and the logic for bailouts for the auto industry. Um, the logic for the bailouts was even if just a single supplier uh, of say automobile parts were to go uh, uh, under, it still makes sense to uh, support people who may not necessarily be tied to that because there can be this uh, cascading fail failure. This idea that uh, if a sufficiently large supplier goes out of business, excuse me, if a sufficiently large supplier goes out of business, then the remaining suppliers don't have the immediate economies of scale to pick up that slack. So uh, Darren Asamoglu uh, et al. come up with this 
paper, this model in 20, 2012 to kind of justify some of, some of these, uh, uh, well, to explore the justification for these uh, cascading failures. Uh, again, the Robert Lucas argument is, well, law of large numbers, these things will dissipate, you're not really show up at the macroeconomic level. But uh, what Asimoglu et, et al. show is that if there is only one supplier to multiple sectors, then the shocks do not, in fact, average out. As a matter of fact, they can grow. Uh, so relatively small shocks seem to have outsized uh, effects. So this is a model uh, that is uh, blatantly stolen. I mean, borrowed from As the Asimoglu et al. paper in Econometrica 2012, very interesting paper, uh, where you have multiple sectors. Sector one up here at the top is, um, sector one is a supplier to uh, multiple other sectors, say two, three, four, five, through some arbitrary number n. Now, if you if you had a network where each one of the where one only supplied to two, and, and another sector only supplied to three, etc., that's where everything starts to average out. But if sector one has some sort of failure, some sort of shock to the system, then it spills over into two, three, etc., uh, into n, uh, which then have their own import, uh, input output shocks as well. Um, well, let's say here. So for cascading expert failure, the idea is basically the same. There is a sole or a sufficiently large supplier of expert opinion to multiple sectors, two, three, four, five. That expert, uh, that expert fails in some way in their advice. In other words, the advice uh, does not achieve the intended purposes. Um, and so a relatively small failure can uh, spill over into multiple, multiple sectors. In the paper, I give several examples, uh, mostly from the pandemic, just uh, because that's what's fresh on everybody's mind. Uh, but a, a particular example that we'll be talking about are COVID testing. Early on in the pandemic, there simply were not a lot of COVID tests available. Uh, and there was a lot of debate about how to allocate these scarce resources. The statisticians and the epidemiologists in the early days of the pandemic wanted to use the tests, the tests for randomized testing of the population. J.P. Ionides, who's a world famous uh, epidemiologist, statistician, he's done economics work. This man is a modern day uh, polymath. He was one of the largest voices saying, we need randomized testing of the population. We need to figure out how this thing spreads. We don't even know the N uh, for us to even have a remote idea talking about uh, cases, infections, fatalities, things like that. However, the public health uh, administration, so the CDC, WHO, uh, European CDC, they wanted to allocate the tests to testing those who show symptoms so that they might be tracked, they might be treated, and they might be released. The problem with these two uh, opposing ideas is that they rest on fundamentally different assumptions. When you don't know the N, the population, when you do not know uh, the characteristics of a disease, you need randomized testing in order to help figure that out. That is what the epidemiologists and the statisticians were saying. We need that basic information. When the characteristics of a disease are known, such as the flu, such as, say, cholera, or typhoid, or dysentery, or any of these other diseases, uh, that are well known and well established. And the public health approach makes sense. We know the approximate infection rate, how things like cholera or Ebola spread. It makes more sense to test those that are showing symptoms to confirm and to treat. So there was this early, early on argument. What plays into this as well is that case and death figures are being used to guide policy. In the early days of the pandemic, you had governors, you had senators, representatives, the president of the United States, uh, 
all over the world, people were saying, we need to know, uh, we need to know what policies we need to enact. You know, Anthony Fauci, Deborah Bricks, what do we need to know in order to fight this thing? Well, the public health experts ended up winning, mostly because they have the regulatory authority. The CDC, uh, the CDC and FDA basically came out and said, look, here in the United States, you can only use the tests that we approve, which I imagine as a total absolute coincidence just happened to be the test that the CDC built. It's purely coincidence, I'm sure of that. Uh, you can only use those tests and you can only use them for people who are showing signs, who are hospitalized or have recently come back from, uh, from China. This is February, March, 2020. So right now China is the only source of the outbreak. Well, the problem with that is uh, we had a lot of upward bias early on. The people who are hospitalized with COVID represent a fairly small minority of uh, total infections. Uh, in fact, if you take uh, the asymmetric uh, asymptomatic infection uh, story to heart, then hospitalizations fall even uh, lower. But those who are hospitalized end up are, are the ones that are uh, uh, infected. How can I say this? They tend to have the worst infections. They're more likely to die. They're more likely to end up on ventilators and in hospital, well, obviously hospital beds if they're hospitalized. Um, so early on in the pandemic, we're testing and we're seeing death rates that are abnormally high for a, uh, SARS, a, uh, a coronavirus. Coronaviruses are among the most uh, common viruses uh, to affect humans. The common cold is a type of coronavirus. Uh, there are obviously more extreme cases like SARS-1, the current uh, COVID virus, uh, SARS-2, MERS, uh, things like that, but they're also more benign. Regardless, we were seeing death rates extraordinarily high. And the reason for that is we weren't randomized testing. We were uh, testing those who were showing symptoms, testing those in hospital beds, testing those that uh, were most extreme. Regardless, that being the only empirical data that we had uh, would go into building the models, like the Imperial College model, the models uh, used uh, here in the United States and other places uh, to build these forecasts. These forecasts ended up being uh, very, very dire. Uh, at this point in the pandemic, uh, the early forecasts showed we should, have, we should be anywhere between 2.2 and 3 million deaths, uh, and that's including uh, uh, taking steps to alleviate. So these policies went in, went before policymakers. Uh, these forecasts went before policymakers only to, uh, and they would in turn guide policy and still do uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, the CDC, FDA here, became the sole supplier of expert opinion in the United States. In other countries, it was uh, other organizations. There was SAGE in, the Europe, in um, Great Britain. Uh, uh, there are various other organizations in different uh, European, uh, European, African, and Asian countries. But they were all built off these uh, expert opinion models uh, coming from sole suppliers. So to go back to our uh, our model, uh, just you know the case of the United States. Although what I'm hoping to do in a future paper with Roger is to uh, generalize this to the rest of the world, is uh, this provider of information sector one, uh, the, in this case the Centers for Dis Disease Control, and um, gave out their expert opinion based on, they uh, made a judgment about how to allocate tests. That in turn would affect multiple sectors. It, it uh, affected forecasting, leading to uh, unusually high forecasts. Uh, it affected policymakers. It would, uh, it would affect uh, private decisions, uh, as Pete Leeson and Louis Renault write about in Southern Economic Journal, or, um, uh, Goldsby and uh, I can't remember the other guy's name off the top of my head. 
uh, in public finance. A lot of people were making private decisions based on these, locking down uh, earlier, even before mandates were showing up. Uh, it was affecting how education and uh, uh, education and public health. A lot of hospitals were shutting down. Um, non uh, non uh, life threatening surgeries uh, for fear that they were going to need these massive amounts of beds, things like that. A lot of schools went very quickly and haphazardly over to online learning. Um, so a relatively small uh, expert failure, just choosing one. Uh, one method of allocation of resources over another, a, a method that um, is suboptimal given the conditions that we had, ended up causing all these other sectors to, uh, to have suboptimal outcomes as well. Uh, again, if this, these sorts of things happen all the time. I was a forecaster for five years as a business consultant. I blew forecasts, did it all the time. And I blew them for big companies too. Uh, you know, one, one of my forecasts caused a Fortune 500 company to, uh, to lose three, $30 million. That was not fun. Uh, but it did not cause a worldwide macroeconomic crisis the way that, uh, the way that some of these did. And that's because the small bits of expert failure that I participated in, that experts participated in all the time, tend to get, uh, tend to get uh, um, aggregated out when there are multiple experts providing multiple opinions and, and uh, sectors uh, interacting with one another. Uh, these things tend to, to um, tend to aggregate out, the law of large numbers would predict. But when there's a sole supplier, or only a handful of suppliers of information, of expert opinion, then uh, we tend to get these uh, cascading effects to other sectors. And we can complicate this model even more uh, as sector two, uh, which we'll just say hypothetically, this is you know now the forecasters, they played into uh, decisions made by three, four, and five as well. They were not only consumers of expert opinion, but producers as well. So these effects tend to get uh, tend to get multiplied and uh, uh, grow exponentially as, uh, as uh, time goes on. The next steps for this model, so this paper is currently under an R&R, &R, which of course means that I am accepting, I would love to hear any comments and feedback. But uh, the next steps of this is to uh, build uh, an agent-based model is uh, what I'm talking about with Abby Devereaux and uh, my old uh, grad school roommate, John Schuler, uh, to make this a bit more dynamic. Right now, we just kind of have a single string plucking uh, and it uh, spreads out two, three, four through N. Uh, but an agent-based model can give us a more uh, dynamic way of looking at this, uh, this effect and these models. Um, so that's, that's the next steps for cascading expert failure. That's where I am right now. The basic idea uh, of these uh, production failures, in this case, the production of expert opinion, when there is a sole or a small number of, uh, of providers to multiple sectors. So uh, keep trying to keep things a little bit short to maximize the amount of feedback uh, that we can get. Um, uh, so I guess I will stop here. I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see all your, uh, your faces. It's hard to do this when not looking at anybody's face. Uh, so I guess, yeah, we'll just stop here. I will stop rambling, which is what I always do when I'm nervous and uh, throw it open to comments. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. All right, so I guess uh, I'll jump in as uh, people are doing the raise their hand thing. And uh, this, you actually just, I, uh, unrelated to the paper, that whole thing about whether you see people's faces or not, I'm getting mixed feedback because some people say, uh, well, I don't want to be on YouTube. We're just looking at the blank screen, right, as a, as a participant. And then on the other hand, well, that means you don't see anyone. So anyway, uh, as for the paper, um, 
I, uh, I it's changed, right? It's a lot since uh, since it was on on Slack, since we've discussed, and uh, it's interesting how how it's uh, evolved. So good progress, I guess. Um, I have a hard time uh, with the whole. Um, there are two parts, but the hard part uh, for me right now is the accepting that everyone just follows the advice of the expert, right? Like. Um, the why did people like you say people uh, shut down early based on the advice but i feel like other factors played a role right maybe it was like fear of liability or maybe peer pressure like my, my gustavus right we closed ahead of uh, mandate but not because uh they listened to the cdc they closed because everyone around us was closing right if saint olaf which is our competitor is closing we are going to do the same thing right so so there are different mechanisms sort of not just like following the advice so maybe it's not so much like it was bad advice i mean it was right or bad, bad expert but also they um effectively block discovery of other information right like there is uh, so anyway so what do you think of that yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, there's a two paragraph part that keeps going in, then I take it out, then it goes in, then it goes out, you know, which uh, one of the best things I ever, a bit of advice I ever got was keep a uh, separate document called cut words and, you know, instead of deleting, put stuff in there. Uh, where I do, I do in fact address that. It does effectively block uh, discovery uh, in the case of mandates and regulations, it forbids discovery of new processes. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that that's a big part of it. Um, and the peer pressure, the way that I see it is, it's another step of, or it's another step of the cascade. You know, the advice came out and whether or not St. Olaf's or whoever whoever was the first one who said, oh, we need to oh, do this. Mm -hmm. There is still the, the peer pressure aspect, but uh, I would tie it back to, you know, if, if the CDC never made that recommendation, mm -hmm. then would St. Olaf's, let's just say St. Olaf's is the opinion maker here. Sure. I'm sure, I mean, we all know that your college is the superior one. We all know that. No, <laughs> Go ahead. Oh wait, this is but, being recorded. I didn't say that. No, I, I will have to cut out this part. Anyway, go ahead. Sorry, <laughs> I'm just teasing. Um, but uh, so there's going to be some decision, some opinion maker, and the opinion maker is the one who's going to. When I say opinion maker here, just think a celebrity, you know, some fashion person. Uh, they're going to be the first one to take the action. Then, then you're going to have the bunch of followers. But it's still, why did that person take that uh, first step? Because the CDC or or whoever. Um, so that is actually another paper I want to write: is why do people follow expert opinion? How do they choose among competing experts? Things like that. I think there's a very Adam Smith story to tell there. Um, but uh, so I don't really go into it here because I want to try and focus on the institutional aspects and the, the cascade from one down to two, three, four, and five. Um, but yeah, I, I do, I think there's the discovery aspect thing and there is the uh, opinion setter versus opinion follower or fashion setter, fashion follower uh, argument as well. Okay, uh, so we have uh, Erwin, go ahead, yeah. I think you're, Erwin, if you want to jump in, with your, you're, you're, okay, you're right. Yep, sure. Yeah, uh, thanks, John. I think all of my comments in some sense are going to be unfair because they're in part also questions that I still struggle with with, whole, with all of Roger's projects. And Roger's not here, uh, so... It's, no, it's, he's, it's in Sudley, he's in Sudley, Italy right now. Yeah, so, not so, dealing it's, with so, the so, it's, so it's very unfair, but you're building on his project. So I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to ask some of the questions anyway. And part of why I think Roger is so important is that I always admired Roger's work for, you know, you've also been at GMU, with, there you have Dan Klein and right, he says knowledge flat talk and there's... Uh, yeah, Roger's all the work, stressing a lot of subjectivity. He brought in a lot of various notions of knowledge into the conversation. 
And all of this seems to be, seems to me, the notion of expert failure itself, and now how it gets applied here, feels like knowledge flat talk to me. Like it, it brings knowledge down to a sort of objective flow of information that you now trace through a network that happens to have one particular structure, a hierarchical structure. But I just struggle with the very basic conceptualization of knowledge in the in the whole scheme. So I would think that the perspective that I would have expected Austrian minded people to have, or perhaps Roger to have, is that even if you have a relatively hierarchical system, you still have all these knowledge assembly processes going on at various levels. So yes, the CDC is important, but don't turn the state into one actor. So there, there's multiple things going on. There's politicians with incentives like better safe than sorry, uh, right? There, there's all sorts of things going on there. Might even in the CDC, there might be different departments uh, who are struggling to sort of put, put this thing together. We also know from expert literature that it's not a mechanical use of any model, but that they're relying on multiple sources of information. And then of course, when it gets trickled down, you just get process after process in which yeah, I sort of question a sort of objective flow of information, no matter how you trace it through the network, right? I mean, I, I do think that this point about the network structure is quite important and that there might be something very real there. And I, I like the link that you make to the Asimoglu stuff, but yeah, the knowledge assembly point just seems to be lost in this project. And that, that is puzzling to me. Yeah, uh, that's a, so I'll tell you upright, that's a conversation Roger and I have had on multiple occasions. We've been talking about that for years, even before I decided to come up to Syracuse and join him. Um, that's an internal debate I'm having with myself as well. Because um, I'm a student of Dan Klein, I'm a student of Don Boutreau, both of them are on my chair, or excuse me, both of them are on my committee, as is Alex Tabarrok. So it's a very, you know, there's a lot of conversations about this paper. And uh, frankly, I don't have a good answer to give you, Irvin, as much as I would like to. Um, kind of the weasel answer, that I give myself so I can sleep at night or at least sleep easier at night is I'm exploring regulatory behavior. So there is something of an objective function here. Like, yes, there's all the CD internal conversations. I'm taking that as given, this was the recommendation. This was the expert opinion. This was a string that was plucked. Let's see what happens. Again, that's kind of a weasel answer. There's way more about this that I think that's part of the reason why I want to go in an age of based model direction. The problem is I'm not smart enough for that. Uh, that is going to be a collaboration, God willing, a collaboration between me, Abby Devereaux, and John Schuler, if you guys know him. Um, you know, that, that I think is the natural, and I think the Austrian way to go with this is some sort of ABM or uh, something along those lines. Uh, here, I'm just trying to cram my way into the standard literature uh, with Asamaglu and all that. Uh, an earlier version of this relied more heavily on uh, a evolutionary economics model uh, that Roger built that I think dealt with some of your objections more cleanly. But the feedback I got both from the journal that this has uh, got an R&R from and from my committee is this, it's so niche, it's so obscure, you're gonna have a hard time selling anyone on this. Just there's already this existing cascading production failure network expert uh, next network stuff. Use that model. So I, I'm sympathetic, I agree with you 100 percent Irvin. It's you know, it, it's I, it's the angle that I would like to go down at some point. Uh, but right now it's I, I can't easily reconcile those those issues, even though they are crucially important. Okay. I, uh, I'm gonna jump in, Nate, before letting you ask your question, because I, I, I feel like uh, Erwin uh, is uh, speaking to something that I had a trouble expressing, which um, in terms of this, uh, the knowledge assembly. So um, 
the CDC, FDA, the CDC advice here, right? It's really like just sensory data and elements, right? Into individuals' decision making to the individual experience. And now, and just so um, it's not just like transfer of objective information, right? It's a piece of the element. And I think uh, where you can see this sort of empirically is looking at how different people responded and how, how different organizations closed down, right? So uh, those organizations that were worried about uh, liability, like universities, uh, they shut down either ahead of mandates, right? So they, they basically, or um, they, there were many organizations that just wanted to say, we follow the CDC, right? But there were other organizations like restaurants, gyms, right, local gyms, and so on that they just um, they were more willing to take other information and they were looking at things like hmm, how many people are getting sick in my state and so on right so um so i don't think um so that's one way to get at this right it's not objective information because uh, not everyone responds to it uh, in the same way we take it as a piece into our decision making and we uh but what made uh, so many people follow the advice or seem like it, uh, it was, um, or seem like they follow the advice and adopted it as objective information might be the liability, right? Or might be the, well, in the absence of information, we do what we are told, right? By the, by the experts. So. Yeah. And, uh, and what I think is a fantastic op-ed, J.P. Ionides, does say he's writing now in this March 2020, so the early days of the pandemic. He's saying, like, look, ultimately we're going to find that the lockdowns were not necessary, but given the inform given the, the lack of information and how bad this thing could potentially be, you know, if you have coronavirus is a long scale, you have the common cold on one end, you have SARS on the other. Mm -hmm. If this thing is SARS, you want to lock down. So he does say, like, you know. At that point, the lockdowns probably did did indeed make sense, but we need to be doing this randomized testing to find out whether this is SARS, co uh, common cold, or somewhere in between. Turns out it is closer to SARS than it is common cold, but, um, and you're right, everybody faces different costs, alternative, or different alternatives, different cost structures, how they're gonna behave differently. Um, all of that does uh, go into, into play and, you know, if you, I think there could also be another expert failure. Well, this might be more of a public choice story, depending on how you want to split that hair, uh, where once the CDC, uh, or excuse me, once the politicians in each of the states here in the United States, you know, everything was done state by state rather than federal government. Once they started saying, all right, Massachusetts, we're, we're locking down, New York, we're locking down, blah, blah, blah. Then, then there's that crowding out, well, crowding out of alternatives how could could gyms have stayed open and they just did different precautions things like that that they tried to do that in uh, worcester massachusetts uh where a gym owner uh it's like hey look you know we have sanitation stations we have all these things we're putting up barriers in between the stations so that people don't get sick blah 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 and governor baker's just said no you're shutting down and if you try to defy this order you're, i'm arresting you so Okay, Nathan, go ahead. Sorry, we we have made you wait a long time. So go ahead. All right, I'm learning. Thank you very much. A um, couple of thoughts. One, uh, you can follow the university networks, which would be an interesting way of tracing it and repeated patterns. So, for example, uh, you know, Princeton went first this time, I think, uh, and then um, some of the other Ivies, and then and then NYU. Uh, interestingly, Mitch Daniel, Daniels did not pull the trigger, and so we here at Ball State did not fall. Um, we finished out the semester, right? Uh, and, and and in Indiana, it's always Mitch that goes first, and nobody does anything unless Mitch has has done it first. Uh, and and that kind of behavior um, really does rely on Smithian sympathetic exchange. It's it's about the approbation that you receive from participating the way that you're supposed to behave within those networks and the desire is to belong inside of those networks right uh and so i i always point to richard waitley catalactics uh as a way of talking about this and thinking about how informal groups 
don't necessarily exercise decision making power, but they um, they they provide or withhold legitimacy from the decisions that are made by those who are in positions of power. And so you can go back into some ideas of legitimacy and whether whether uh, whether a, a particular agency is being treated as legitimate and and legitimacy is granted or withheld by the way that we talk. Uh, it, there's the tacit social contract embedded in the way that we talk with one another and, and the way that we um, generate approbation or, or disapprobation for the way that others are talking and behaving. So uh, th that's a broad set of ideas that I would bring into to what you're trying to get at. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm glad you brought that up. That's what I was trying to get at with the whole opinion maker thing. Adam Smith also talks about in the theory of moral sentiments, the power of wealth and celebrity on shaping what what is appro uh, uh, approved of. You know, he gives the example of, uh, I think it's Charles II, and how what he was doing at court was, from a virtue ethics standpoint, not great, but because it was court, it was the celebrity, a lot of people adapted that or adopted that, those uh, fashions, those uh, vices uh, to try and, and behave like that. So, you know, it, it would be interesting to look at, and this might be how I tackle that paper idea, is look at, okay, which universities were moving first? And you said Princeton, right? Or I, as far as I can tell, this go around, Princeton, Princeton went first. Yeah, and, and I mean, Princeton. It's bad, you know that you know you're coming from the Dan Klein angle. I'm coming from the David Levy angle. Um, and so, yeah. Which I, I mean, you know, both of those are good angles. So maybe we combine the two and make it the Murphy Snow angle. Uh, but uh, yeah, you know, Princeton's Ivy League. So if they're going to do something, a lot of the, the schools that want to be Ivy League or even just want to appear that they, you know, want to be Ivy League um, will, will behave a lot of the same way. I mean, we see that all the time in our journals. Like, oh, print, here I am quoting Asamoglu and, and all these guys. You know, that, that's what the big guys are doing. Yeah, uh, Arvind, yes. Is there, I, yeah. I, I just wanted to follow up on, because I also understand it, and I'm sympathetic to, to John also wanting to tell the story to, to a broader audience, but I do think that these three comments combined sort of suggest that if you add a little bit of structure uh, or heterogeneity to the model that you have yeah. in, in the sense of closeness to the CDC and perhaps the federal government, you might say something interesting about uh, differences between sectors. Um, and you might say something interesting about differences within sectors um, in the sense that, uh, that Nathan was just suggesting, right? And yeah, there could even be a bit of standard economics, right? In, in an oligopolistic market, you have sort of a price leader and then, right, the rest of the follow it. Of course, it's sort of imperfect model, but it, it's at least a sort of dynamic that I think adds something to the cascading, which now seems rather mechanical. And uh, then you get away from that a, a little bit by adding some, some heterogeneity in, in, in the sense of, of distance from it. it might even be, you know, sort of in a very silly, <laughs> silly way, physical distance from Washington DC or so, or from, from New York City. I don't know. I don't know enough about US geography to be making this sort of suggestion like that. But, there is a sort of differential, or there has been a differential effect on different sectors and how, and how they how they've dealt with it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's. Uh, uh, I like that idea a lot. So, and it, it's something that I was thinking about as well earlier on in the pandemic. Uh, the areas that were first forcibly shut down by the states are the ones where the states have the most authority, that is liquor licenses, uh, at least in Massachusetts and Maryland. Uh, I grew up in Massachusetts and I lived in Maryland at the time. They went hard after bars, casinos, restaurants, uh, anywhere that needed a liquor license, 
um, and they went hard, which was weird because at the time there were no transmit nothing, no transmissions linked to dining experiences or bars or anything. They went after them hard. So it may not be literal physical distance, but regulatory distance. The closer, the more that the state has you in their grip, the more they can just say, oh, we'll take away your, your liquor license, which for a restaurant, especially the brewery where uh, John Schiller and I used to frequent and, um, you know, they threatened like, oh, we'll take away your liquor license. That's it. That's game over. That's game over for these guys. I mean, that's, yeah. So, yeah, that, that would be a real good, I think, public choice regulatory distance story that one, one could tell. I like that idea a lot. I'm going to totally steal it. Right. And uh, in a sense, it's distance, but also sort of uh, what you have to lose, right? So universities uh, could quite easily, as we've learned, right, uh, move on um, to the this is a distance learning model. So the easiest thing was to just follow the CDC, right? Like if I don't know what to do, I'm just gonna follow the, the expert. But for the gym owner, much harder, right? Much harder to do distance. Um, I mean, they've done it, but but the adoption is harder, especially if you have like heavy, if your gym has a lot of heavy equipment and so on. Um, that's much harder to, to replace in the internet so uh, sort of environment. So that's where they would have far more to lose in terms of business and uh, or the drinking places, right? Like uh, how do you replicate that online? Very hard. So uh, so then they would search for other sorts of information. And then there is, uh, I, I was um, just rereading re this very old paper by uh, Dick Wagner on fiscal illusion. I, I'll put it in the chat. But um, it's a paper where basically, um, how is it that the fiscal institutions change our preferences and our perceptions, right? Like fiscal illusion means that we end up um, demanding more government output than, than we would if we knew the actual costs. And how do we explain that without uh, some sort of irrationality? And that and the explanation he gives is the, is the absence of information right if you have no if you don't have actual experience and the actual information we and no competition in the information you don't actually have uh, you you don't know so you turn to emotions and, and ideology and group thing for the decision making right so um, so maybe it's not so much that the cdc is uh, providing information but they are basically the focal point and um, and sort of like this uh, the the mo yeah the ideology um, is the replacement for for knowledge more than the, than, than the knowledge itself. So yeah, yeah. I mean, they're, they're they're the shelling point. It's yeah. you know I don't know where my wife is going to be. She doesn't know where I'm going to be. But we both figure, hey, you know, probably going to meet at the at the cash register. I think that's Thomas Schelling's uh, sure. example. But yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. I, I like, yeah, there are lots of different ways to, um, to uh, attack this project. And then so. do you plan on spending more time or maybe another project where you go a little more into the emergence of a single like expertise? You would think like from the sort of um, benevolent dictator sort of uh, story that uh, they would want competition, right, in expertise because well, you give better advice if you if you have competition. So, uh, is there a good story for why there's such a desire for uh, for just being the single expert? Yeah. So, at least in the business literature uh, that Roger and I are dealing with right now, there's a number of different stories. Uh, it's mostly uh, psychological stories. Which, while I recognize the value of that, I, being an economist, I'm, I I kind of want to, you know, distance from. But the, the business psych, organizational psych literature essentially argues uh, experts like power. They like the power that expertise gives them. When they get challenged, uh, they don't like they don't like that. Uh, so they end up, in turn, either becoming either compensating by getting super super precise, like 
this is how smart I am. I can narrow my confidence range down to this much for right? the other guy. He's this much, or they can just get uh, dismissive. Like, Oh yeah, he's, he's fine, but he, you know, he does, he's not me. Now this is focusing on expert, mostly consultants selling their expertise to uh, other buyers. Um, but uh you know, I think there are stories there that we could uh, tell more broadly. There's, of course, Anthony Fauci's couple of lines. Where he's like, oh, I am the science. I represent the science. They don't like me because I am the science. Um, that sort of thing. You know, we can always tell an ego story. Uh, I think there's also a Telukian gains trap story, just a simple, if we want to stick simple economics, to get to expertise. I mean, look at everybody in this room. We all paid a very high price to get to this level. You know, a PhD is an extremely expensive uh, uh, hoop to jump through. And then to get, you know, God willing for me, tenure track or something at a university, you know, everybody else here, yeah. You know, we, we paid those rents, but we're, or we paid those, we're not getting this, the extra normal profits that would be suggested by our monopoly positions Opening up it, that into competition can mean real losses, the way that Gordon Tullock talks about. So I, I think there's there's a story to be told there. I'm just talking out of my uh, my mouth right now. That's something that I would like to explore. But you know, I, I think there's there's a Tullockian gains trap, a uh, Tullockian uh, transactional gains trap story with expertise, and why there's a resistance to uh, increase in competition. So Levy has a, a paper at the um, Supreme Court Review, I think, um, that where, where Adam Smith gets quoted in a, in a lawsuit. I think uh, David Souter is the one who brings it up. But um, there's an idea of, of testing regulation and the opinions of experts by jury, such that you have to submit the ideas of the expert to the democratic arena. So there is a discussion that takes place around the activities or the decisions being made by the experts. Uh, and, and the jury would be po pulled the way any jury is, right? Yep. So you have to, you bring just regular folks in to discuss the ideas. The, uh, the alternative experts present um, their points of view, right? But in order to keep it from becoming purely adversarial, they have to seek out the approval of, of the jury and they have to describe things in a way that is relevant. It, it pushes us back into the appropriate role of an expert in any context, which is to describe the facts of a situation as well as we understand them to the democracy so that they can then deliberate to take the Knightian approach to all of this, right? So, so a check on on experts is to uh, to instead submit is submitted to a discussion somehow. Yeah, and I just threw in the chat Milgram and Roberts 1985 paper relying on the information of interested parties, uh, which I mean they go more pure adversarial, uh, and they build a model that shows when you have an adversarial uh, exchange of information like in a, uh, in a courtroom, there's the incentive for both parties to reveal as much information as possible and the decision maker becomes fully informed. Um, and that's the basis of Roger and my current paper that we're working on up here at SU. Um, that I think is, I, I think that idea of having to put stuff out, A, uh, so people can talk about it and be in a format that people can, uh, that the common or, you know, layman can understand is crucial to uh, increasing the informative, the information available to the, uh, to the decision maker, whether it be politician or the, the polity. Um, and also reducing some of these uh, expert failures where what the expert might think the goal of the non-expert is, uh, 
versus what the expert, the non-experts goal actually is, um, you know, that conversation helps reveal, reveal information and reveal knowledge. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of uh, that idea, uh, Nathaniel, although I'm not 100, I'm pretty sure I know the David Levy paper you're talking about, but I'm not 100% sure. Yeah, I'll see if I can figure it out and, and get in touch with you. I'll just scroll through his uh, his uh, Google Scholar there, profile. There Mark, Marta, did I understand your question right in the sense that you wanted to know why politicians have an interest in creating a monopoly on expertise? Because that seems to me one of the puzzles. And I would attack it from the other angle than John was attacking the issue. Uh, and so look at the incentive structure of the politicians. But yeah, no, because in the, uh, I, I still don't know if they are producing knowledge or even advice. I think it's ideology, right? That we get and sort of the, because um, it's like this in Pareto sort of uh, realms of non-logical action, right? It's not that they give you information on which you actually um, it's more of this like focal point ideology emotions right that we that we end up getting it's not uh, very testable so um so i uh, yeah i i mean of course there's a power story sort of uh, all sorts of ways in, in which you could explain this but i i don't know if i have a clear mechanism in my mind of why uh why you would want to be a, a single um single expert right um, yeah. Yeah, I work much shorter in, in, in consultancy than I understand John has done. But my understanding always was that I was there to bail the manager out. And I recognize this dynamic from politics. So, I mean, the, 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 uh, in uh, the UK, that first press conference, I'll never forget because Boris Johnson is, I, I guess, right, one of the most cockiest politicians in the world. And after five minutes, he shut up and gave the word to the guy at, of the NHS, or mm -hmm. might have even been a woman. I, I am that, that that I don't remember very vividly, but the, to me, it was a very powerful moment. But also a moment that demonstrates that from here on out, he's not making decisions anymore. He's relying on his experts, and so when he goes wrong, it's because the experts went wrong and not because he went wrong. And this this would be. I mean, I, I don't think it's a full story that explains everything, but for me, one of the key sort of institutional dynamics that goes on and the university administrators face this all the time, right? I, I think we also know that from other scandals around, right? right. Just, just minimize the scandals and not really do what is right. So, the, so there's it's not a, the search for truth, right? I think that's what, yeah. So, yeah, you, you I, that's very helpful. They're not searching for truth. They're searching for the for the narrative, for bailing out, for some someone to blame. Right? Would be probably. yeah, or or ducking responsibility a, yeah. a little bit, indeed. Yeah, and uh, I've, I mean, it could be worse, right? I mean, a lot of people feared at the beginning of the pandemic that we would single out particular groups, and and right. I mean, that hasn't oh, yeah. really well, happened. So, yeah. And so right, and that would be scapegoating in a much more negative sense. And of course, around South Africa, we recently saw it a little bit, but then there was also a lot of pushback, like this kind of scapegoating apparently is still off the table. We're not going to blame the South Africans for having a variant, mm -hmm. right? And we renamed them because that it would lead to stigma. So, I mean, the scapegoating isn't the whole story. There's other things going on, but I do think that this relying on experts uh, in periods of great uncertainty, right? Whether it's business managers or whether it's politicians, there's a sort of powerful dynamic there uh, that you, yeah. That you, and you uh, I'm sure in consulting, you, uh, your organization understood that your value is in sort of this uh, prestige and reputation for which you sort of have to have some monopoly power, right? So. Yeah, or sometimes the people already knew what I had to do, right? They had to reorganize. <laughs> Yeah. But it was a bad, it, so I was the bearer of bad news, right. uh, or my colleagues were the bearers of bad news. And yeah, that was a, I was a very functional mechanism, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the organization had to continue living and it, it would have hurt a lot of relationships very badly in that organization if 
the, the bad news would have been brought by somebody who's in the organization. So you bring in somebody from the outside. There's also interim managers who have their sole function is this. They come in, they get called an asshole for a year, they get paid a lot of money, and then they move out and the organization is more or less healed or somewhat reorganized or restructured. Yeah, I mean, as a consultant, for my, my big clients, uh, the big corporations, it was very much, oh, we're going to hire you to justify what, to hire you to justify my, my uh, goals. But the smaller businesses, the ones that needed to be more nimble, to be more adaptive, who didn't have the market power, they were very much more of the, hey, we need the information. Mm. And it was much more of a, it, it wasn't the, the relationship you just described. It was more of a, you know, help us, uh, guide us, talk with us, talk with our, our internal experts. There was one company that I was hired to be a check to their, um, their internal forecasts because their forecasts were like, oh, we're going to get 15% growth. I'm like, mm, this is a recession. <laughs> Good luck with that. Yeah. Um, so. Excellent. Okay. Do we have any other questions or? Uh, okay. It looks like uh, we're slowly uh, winding down uh, in the discussion. So uh, with the so, sort of smaller group today, I guess we, we have a little bit of, uh, we're going to finish ahead of time. Uh, John, any uh, final thoughts you, you want to share? Um, uh, uh not really thanks everybody for the feedback um i mean there, there are i think there's a lot of paper ideas here and uh you know the kind of my my goal for the tenure process is to build out this stuff so when i get tenure i'm going to remember all of you for your awesome suggestions uh you know, th thanks again for spending your uh, your Tuesday afternoon here. I really appreciate it. It's good to see folks I haven't seen in a while. Irvin, at some point we're going to meet in person. I don't know when. It's weird that we're at the same university now, except I'm 500 miles away, but, you know, whatever. Um, and John, uh, good to see you again, even though your video isn't there. But, uh, you know, everybody, good to see you. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. And... Uh, you know, I look forward to, to seeing everybody in person again at some point, God willing. Yeah, thank you all for coming on the call in this really busy uh, holiday season. So I appreciate that. Good luck with your final grading and all that. And uh, I will see you all in uh, the new year, yes, in 2022. So yeah, take care, stay safe, be healthy. The holidays, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.